Can you do it again? Alright, let's try. Hello and welcome to another episode of The Living Myth with me, James Cossum. I've been flying solo today and uh, the subject of the day is the coming of the two-headed dawn into Ireland. So this is the first story in Lady Gregory's anthology of Irish mythology and it's the kind of the, the Gaelic equivalent of the first book of Genesis. It's about as far back as we can go in the history of Ireland and that's, that's really exciting and it's very, in some ways it's quite dense because it's much more almost just archetypal imagery is laced through it rather than as, as clear of a narrative. So I love that kind of stuff and there's loads to unpack there so that's what we're going to be looking at today. So I'm going to be talking just a little bit, I'll, I'll have a read through Lady Gregory's story and then yeah, just talk, we'll talk a bit around it, pick out certain points and explore them. So yeah, I hope you enjoy it and let's jump right in. It was in a mist that two had dawn him, the people of the gods of Dana, or as some call them, the men of Dee, came through the air and the high air to Ireland. It was from the north they came, and in the place they came from they had four cities where they fought their battle for learning. Great Phalius, the shining Glorious, and Phineas, and rich Murius that lay to the south. And in those cities they had four wise men to teach their young men skill and knowledge and perfect wisdom. Senius and Murius, and Arius the fair-haired poet, and Phineas, and Eurius of the noble nature and Gorius, and Morius and Phalius itself. And they brought from those four cities their four treasures, the stone of virtue from Phalius that was called the Leophale, the stone of destiny. And from Gorius they brought a sword, and from Phineas a spear of victory, and from Murius the fourth treasure, the cauldron that no company ever went away from unsatisfied. It was Nuida, king of the two who the dawn at the time, but Mananan, son of Lear, was greater again. And of the others that were chief among them were Agma, brother to the king, that taught them writing, the Ansecht, that understood healing, and Net, the god of battle, and Credinus, the craftsman, and Govnu, the smith. And the greatest among their women were Bav, a battle goddess, and Macha, whose mast feeding was the heads of men killed in battle, and the Marigu, the crow of battle, and Era, and Fola, and Banva, daughters of the Dagda, that all three gave their names to Ireland afterwards, and Aidan, the nurse of poets, and Bridget, there was a woman of poetry, and poets worshipped her, for her sway was very great and very noble, and she was a woman of healing along with that, and a woman of smith's work. And it was, she made for, it was she first made the whistle for calling one to another through the night. And the one side of her face was ugly, but the other side was very comely. And the meaning of her name was Bro Sight, a fiery arrow. And among the other women there were many shadow forms and great queens, but Dana, that was called the Mother of the Gods, was beyond them all. And the three things they put above all others were the plough, the sun, and the hazel tree so that it was said in the time to come that Ireland was divided between those three, Col, the hazel, Kecht, the plough, and Green, the sun. And they had a well below the sea, where the nine hazels of wisdom were growing, that, that is, the hazels of inspiration and of the knowledge of poetry. And their leaves and their blossoms would break out in the same hour, and would fall on the well in a shower that raised a purple wave, and then the five salmon that were waiting there would eat the nuts, and their colour would come out in the red spots on their skin, and any person that would eat one of those salmon would know all wisdom and poetry, and there were seven streams of wisdom that sprang from that well and turned back to it again, and people of many arts have all drank from that well. It was on the first day of Bjotna, that is now called May Day, the two the dawning came, and it was to the northwest of Connacht that they landed, the fear bulks, the men of the bag that were in Ireland before them, and that had come from the south, saw nothing but a mist and it lying on the hills. So that's Lady Gregory's account, and you can probably see what I mean by it being quite dense. There isn't much of a, 
narrative there it's it's more like the biblical listing of names but there's so much information there to, to dive into we get i suppose first of all who are the two who they don't know? so these are the gods of ireland would be the the general agreement that the two who they don't know would have been the gods of the people that were in ireland before the christians came along and the reason why this story would seem incomplete or could be a bit skewed is because all of our Irish mythology was written down by Christian scribes from around the 9th century onwards. So it's not written down by people whose religion it is. Because the Celts were always had an oral tradition, and that's why in France, the Gauls, and Spain, and most, I'm pretty sure, all of, well, not all of Britain, all of England, Scotland has maintained its own, but all of those other Celtic countries have lost their mythology because it was all oral. And that got wiped out. So, in one sense, it's a shame because we don't know what the original story was because it's written down by the Christian scribes who had to somehow integrate it with their religion. But on the other hand, we should be grateful that we have so much material on our mythology at all because if it wasn't for those Christian scribes, it would have been gone completely. And that would have been, you know, we would have had nothing to work with. So there's something to be grateful for, even if we can bemoan the loss of a lot more material. So there's a lot of dense things to unpack there. There's the initial coming of the two of the dawn, and then there's the naming out of the different, their different spheres of influence. And then there's talking about, there was also talk about the treasures and where they came from and who their leaders were uh, before arriving. So there's plenty to unpack, so let's see where we can start from. So I think just the two of the dawn in itself as a term is an interesting place to start because the word two has the people and day comes from the Irish for God. And then I've read that Originally, that was their entire title. So we see the men of D is a translation of two a day. So men of D, D can be think of dia in in Latin or French. It's it's the word for God, Opus Dei, work of God. So two a day is the people of God, and apparently that would have been some sources from what I've read would say that that was the original name of the two of the Donum. and the Donum was only added on later when the Christian scribes in writing to the day applied that name to the Hebrew people, the people of Israel, because in the Bible they are the people of God, they are the two day in that tradition. So for the Christians, they were the two day. so to avoid confusion, they would have appended on Dan and people of the gods of Dan. And so, yeah, so Dan is, is, is an interesting term. We don't actually have there aren't really any other myths uh, about her, even though in this text it says that she's the, the queen of all the gods, or the one they all praise, so a kind of a great mother goddess. So she's not really explored in any depth either. Maybe she's from an, an older year and already even for the Celts, that had begun to disappear, but certainly with the Christian we don't have much material of her. The, the actual name though is interesting, uh, in terms of paralleling it with, let's say, Homer's Odyssey, so or the Iliad, even either or the the different names for the the Greeks and that there's the Achaeans, which is the after Achaea, which we know is kind of northeastern Greece now. Uh, but one of the names that Homer uses for the Greek people as a whole, so Achaeans, Hellenes, and Danans. So we see there's kind of a parallel there. So it could be an Indo-European um, tradition. That could be something that the Christian scribes put on. I uh, can't really say for any certainty, as with so much of Irish mythology, we don't really know what's going on. We can make these connections. We don't necessarily know for certain what, what's, what lies beneath them. So other than that, so these are the two Hidei. I think, what can we look at? So... You've got the, the places it came from, so those kind of, that very musical kind of sound of 
Gorius and Phalius and Phineas and Murius and it's, it's very um, it's got a, a clear meter to it so what's interesting there for me is, is the, the fact that it comes in, in fours there so again this is this is a big important mythological number Jung would say that four was the, the number of wholeness of completeness so it's, it's two two sets of two they complete the square and it's a common thing throughout religions or so here we have the four cities and we have the four treasures but we also have the four cardinal directions we have the, the four basic elements there's the four gospels the four books of the Quran the four Vedas and the four noble truths in Buddhism so this number four is is almost a central part of, of religions and you could look at maybe the Holy Trinity plus Mary as being a, a quaternary as well but that recurrence of fours is, is, is prevalent throughout religion so it's immediately invoked here in the four cities of the two of the dawn and the four treasures that they bring. The treasures themselves are worth delving into so the Lea Fall is an important part of Irish mythology. So Lady Gregory here calls it the, the Stone of Virtue, the Stone of Destiny. And this, you can actually go to see this stone and up in Tara, in County Meath, on one of the hills of Tara, is this ancient stone. And apparently, according to legend, that would sing out when the new High King was crowned there. And... It would shout, and the last time it shouted was Brian Brew in the, I think that's around the 11th century. And he was this famous warrior and studied Caesar and Alexander and very well, very well learned, very well read, and was well as being a great strategic mastermind and managed to unite the whole of Ireland, which hadn't been done in hundreds of years since the Vikings and the Normans were, were on the island. And it's... It's generally said that he had some kind of subterfuge. He was very clever and knew how symbolically powerful the Leah Fall was, so he made sure that it rang out whenever he was crowned king in Tara. And so, yeah, Brian Brew, that was interesting. But if you look back, yeah, so this was a common thing throughout the history of Ireland. It had the significance of crowning the king. And apparently it was supposed to have ended, though, with Cucullin, who, when it didn't... When the Leofal refused to ring out for his friend, who was supposed to become king, uh, Cú smashed it into, he cut it up, uh, being unhappy with it. So it's a recurring theme throughout Irish, Irish mythology, so it's nice to see it here at the very start. The other ones, let's see, there's the, the cauldron that no company ever went away from, that could be the, the cauldron of the Dagda, the, the never-ending pot. So that's, again, what's interesting about these four gifts. Again, you have the Stone of Destiny, you have the Cauldron, you have the Sword and the Spear, and you'll notice those are two instruments of peace and two instruments of war. The spear and the Sword being the two main weapons that the Celts would have used in fighting, and then the Cauldron, the, the, the gift that never stops giving, and the Stone of Virtue, the timeless thing that keeps the tradition true over time. Stones being a sign of a symbol of eternity, as you see with the philosopher's stone. So there's loads of symbolism in that. The sword is often held to be the cleave solace, the, the sword of fire, and like Arthur's original sword, um, what's that called? Calibran. The it's shown with a, with a fire when 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 its user is in the fight, and the spear was said to be of of Lu, who will come to later. So yeah, just what's interesting there, two instruments of war, two instruments of peace, so there's plenty there to, to dig down into. And yeah, so other than that, I'd actually just like to jump to the end because I think there was something interesting at the end of that passage saying that they came on May Day. So again, to connect this in with an archetypal pattern, you see that they arrive on May Day. You find out later that when they meet the Fear Bold, there's talk of a battle, but they decide to push it off for three months so they can get ready. 
And so the fight happens, the first battle of Moitura happens on Midsummer's Day. So you've got these two bookending uh, kind of events, but they, they're very tied in with the calendar. So May Day, obviously, is very important. It's the day of Beautna in Irish mythology, and then Midsummer's Day. So these are two of the four key dates in, in the Gaelic calendar. So it's in, just that you can see the archetypal pattern, that it's not necessarily historical in the same way that Jesus' birth on the 25th of December is tied in with the, it's the first day, I believe, where the sun, let me get this right, it's, it's when the mornings are getting longer again. So those three mornings, 21st, 22nd, 23rd, 24th, those mornings are still getting shorter, and but the 25th is when it starts to turn. So it's the symbol of the, the new dawn, new, the new thing rising. And so Jesus' birth is symbolically that date. As far as historical Jesus, you know, who knows what the date would have been, but that archetypal mythologizing gets mixed in. So we can see that going on here with the Beautna, May Day, and Midsummer's Day being the <clears throat> the day of their battle with the, the fear boat. So that's obviously a significant um, occurrence here. Okay, so we've talked about when they came, and now I'd like to talk a little bit about how they came. So according to Lady Gregory's story, they, they came through the mist, uh, in the ships, on, through the air and the high air. And again, that's a very archetypal kind of imagining that the, these ships coming through the mist in another version of the myth that occurs in the Book of Invasions, another very old manuscript. They come in their ships and they, when they arrive they burn the ships as a sort of, it's a, I guess a, a replication of the Alexander story. Alexander the Great when he crossed into Asia, when he crossed the Hellespont, he burned the he burned his fleet to kind of commit his forces to it's it's burning your bridges behind you and indeed he'd made up bridges out of all his boats so the whole army could cross over that might have been the Persians actually so he burns his boats as a as a, as a sign of no return as a sign of pure determination to succeed and that seems to be a thing here that the two who did dawn and are coming to Ireland they're burning their boats behind them they're committing themselves to Ireland. Now, you look at them coming through the mists and through the air and the high air, and again, that's a very, for me, that seems like very archetypal kind of imagery, thinking of these godlike beings coming through the air, and we think of spirit as being associated with the high, with the high air, the air and the high air, the spiritual and higher aspects of our being, and so it would make sense for these gods to be traveling through the air in that sense. In, in the sense, if they're spiritual beings, that would be their natural domain, almost. So for me, that image makes sense on a on that kind of mythological level. And to think of them coming in ships is something, for me, it brings to mind the, the, the Valar and the, the elves in Lord of the Rings and the, the, the peaceful journey of the ships through the to the to the un, to the promised land, the undying land. So there's that archetypal kind of theme there again, the coming through their ships from the air and the high air. It's a, it's a beautiful image, and the mists as well is quite an interesting thing. To think of with the evolution of new gods, it's it's never quite clear. It's never immediately clear. So. I'm reading a biography of Muhammad at the moment, and like Jesus in Nazareth, it's very hard for the people of Mecca to initially recognize Muhammad as a prophet. It's to other people, it can it can be quite clear, but it's it's that thing of it's a mist, and it's it's the gods are kind of coming through him, and it's 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 not clear. It's like, is this not the guy we've seen? eating and drinking in the marketplace. How is this the messenger of God? And so when the new gods come, it's there's a confusion with the old gods and with the it takes time for it to bleed into the into the human sphere and for us not to to be able to look past the messenger to see the actual 
archetypal message, especially if it doesn't accord with the previous religious sentiments. So Jesus being seen as a heretic by the by the Pharisees and by the Jews of his time and people finding it difficult to accept his beliefs in Nazareth. That was kind of a, a later place where his, his cult would have taken off. So that's again the mist a mist is a very good image of when it comes to the, the evolution of new religious systems that it's vague and it's shadowy until it's right in front of you and yeah so that there's that kind of um, opacity to to this evolution because it's not it's something that's coming up from the collective unconscious and it's not quite clear it's not quite it's very hard to grasp it but eventually it becomes clear enough and people accept that it's true and they pass it on and it's, it seems like of course this was always the way and that's the way with many insights, the way with many eurekas, is that they they come to us out of a fog, out of the fog of unconsciousness until we can finally grasp them and then they seem so obvious and they're such a core part of our lives. And who are these gods? So we get a list of names here and kind of their relationship and their place within the hierarchy. So it's all very interesting. We've got Nuida. So he was the he was the king. So we see he is, plays a big part in later battles. And what's interesting there is Lady Gregory says it was Nuida was king of the two Hidadonan at that time, but Mananan, son of Lear, was greater again. And Mananan is the the Neptune, Poseidon of this of this Gaelic tradition. He's the, the god of the sea. So we'll often find Mananan in, in other stories riding his chariots. Uh, as if it was a flat plain, him and his horses run, uh, running over the water as if it was nothing, as if it was a, a completely solid surface. So he's this uh, powerful um, god of the sea, and it's interesting to see that he's more powerful here than Nuida, who is the king. And that might be significant. I mean, they're they're coming in ships, so you could connect it with that. You could also just say that the importance of water and Again, the, the other worlds, the world of mythical, magical beings, the land of Tir Nino, the, the which is the land of the, the ever young, the paradise, the Elysian fields of Gaelic mythology, that's over the sea as well. We see Oshin goes over the sea. So it's uh, over the sea to these islands is where the other worlds are. And I was also... It twigged a lot of curiosity in me when I saw, I was reading Homer's Odyssey, and when he gets to Hades, I always thought, so in, in one of the later books, he goes down into Hades and has to talk to all the old heroes and meet a lot of influential and powerful people when he's down in the underworld. And I always thought it was a trip underground, as you kind of see in, in later um, mythologies, but it was actually... Cersei told him to go over the sea, so it's beyond the edge of the ocean. He crosses the river, sticks, and then there he sets up a ground and meets the, meets the spirits of the underworld. And there's a kind of an ambiguity in Homer, because at some point it seems it refers to as under, but then to get there it's certainly over the sea. So that connection seems to be maintained here more in Gaelic mythology, where that all, it's the islands and they're over the sea and Tiernan Og has that connection and so in that sense that connection to the eternal to the to the other you can see why Manana might be more important so Nuida is the connection to the gods that are here but Manana is the connection to the beyond to that spiritual realm that lies that lies beyond and has the promise of eternity so that might be one there's a few thoughts on why Manana might be a more important figure there Okay, so who else do we have here? We have Agma, brother to the king, that taught them writing. So there's uh, the traditional, the old style of writing would have been Om. Uh, so I, I don't know, it's, it's written Agma here, maybe his name was Oma. Um, the way this worked was, you, you'll often find these, not that often to be honest, 
but you'll find stones around Ireland, ancient monuments, and they have be stone maybe five foot in height, and apparently you start on one bottom corner, and you read it up. So it's it's what it is. It's, it's markings either cut directly across or at an angle, and if you have two of them together, three of them together, or four of them together, you can have four strikes at an angle or four strikes straight or two. So these are the different letters, and you read it from the bottom up to the top, and then if needs be down the other side. So this is the the Ohm writing, and we see Agma here is brother to Nuida, and he's an influential guy. He's the one that taught them writing. So obviously that Ohm writing comes from the name of Agma, and then we have Dean Kecht who understood healing. And Dia, again, notice that name. Dia is God, and Kek, I think it means a uh, plow, actually. So the god of the plow, but I could be wrong there. There's Net, that's the god of battle, Credin is the craftsman, and Govnu, the smith. Now, Govnu is a character that comes up a lot, as we'll see. He's kind of the, the Hephaestus of, uh, the, of this, or the Hephaestus or Vulcan of the, of the Irish tradition. And he's the one that crafts the spears, and there's a he comes up in a in a good few stories later on, and is quite a quite an interesting character. And then there was the three goddesses, and so what Lady Gregory says: the greatest among their women were Bav, a battle goddess, Macha, whose mast feeding was the heads of men killed in battle, and the Margu, the crow of Baal. So this is a we often considered the triple head of the of a war goddess. So they're the three sides of, of, of one goddess in some sense, rather than three completely independent goddesses. So again the Margu, the crow of battle, there's that, that image of the, the crow being associated with with death and with I guess the carrion picking the apart the corpses on a battlefield. And then we have Era and Fola and Banva, so these are three goddesses The we find in a later myth, the three of them, much like the competition with the three goddesses in Greece talking to, to Paris, um, asking which one is most beautiful. It's We find these three goddesses later talking to, uh, I believe it's one of the, the Gael when they come, asking them to name Ireland after them, to name the, the country after them. So obviously the Era, Fola, Banva, these were all names of Ireland at some point, but Era is the modern name of Ireland. And you find it on the back of coins. The on the back of our Euros it says Era and the year and the heart. So Era is obviously the one that prevailed in the end, and Ireland is Era Era land. And so that's interesting. And then they talk about Aiden, but then Bridget. Now Bridget I find the What's said about her here is very interesting, and Bridget herself is it's is a fascinating character in terms of the syncretism of religions. So you look at she's a, a goddess among the two of the Dawn and the Celts, but then later we find that she's a saint. So she gets integrated into the the Christian religion, and her feast day is the the first of February, it's the first day of spring on the Irish calendar. So that's interesting. She's a, she's both a goddess and then later gets integrated as a saint. And there's a clue in that that we see even in later monotheistic religions, the role played by the gods as a multiplicity. You could say that it's still fulfilled by the saints in the Christian tradition. I know in Islam they have the 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 jinn, the genies. And they have other spirits, and there's the angels as well. So the saints are a way of people pray to saints. So Saint Anthony, if you've lost something, you pray to Saint Anthony. And so you can see saints fulfilling certain roles in the same way as gods and goddesses fulfill certain roles. So it's a way of Christianity saying there's only one God, while maintaining that diversity of sub-figures that people can pray to and emulate more directly. So that's a... Bridget is interesting as a bridge there between the, the two traditions. And so let's see, what, what does great Lady Gregory say about her? She's a woman of poetry. Poets worshipped her. 
for her sway was very great and very noble. And she was a woman of healing along with that, and a woman of Smith's work. And it was she first made the whistle for calling one to another through the night. And the one side of her face was ugly, but the other side was comely. And the meaning of her name was Brosite, a fiery arrow. When I was researching Bridget, what you come across is that her she's she's a goddess of fire. Her connection is is with fire, and even with healing there, with inspiration through poetry, and healing inspiration in Smith's work, they're all they're all. They can be very fiery things. So we noticed there was a god of healing earlier, Diane And you would say, how can you have multiple gods of healing? And one way of looking at it is that Bridget as the, the fiery side of healing, the, the fire of your inner fire, your inner ability to heal yourself, your inner ability, the fires within you that dredge up your immune system and get you, give you the capability to heal yourself. So you could look at the fire in that sense. Another way of looking at it is the inspiration. So when do we think of fire with inspiration? And that's the, the uncontrollable power of inspiration. When, when a poem just comes bursting through you, when we find something like Tolkien said, the, the Lord of the Rings just poured out of him. Um, Muhammad, when with the the Quran, he describes the the when the first verse came to him, it was it was head splitting, it was terrifying, it was a it was a an eviscerating experience in many in many ways. So there's this recurrence of, of the fiery image and inspiration. There are softer forms of inspiration as well, but with, with Bridger, we can think of it as that the fiery side of it and the possessive obsessive side of creativity and inspiration that we see can be so destructive to artists and to creators when they get possessed by their work. So that could be a way of reading, well, the, the fiery inspiration that we might associate with Bridget. And there's one more thing I'd like to touch on there, the, the two sides of her face, the one being ugly and the one being comely. There's a myth that Joseph Campbell talks about in it's an African myth, and the son sneaks into the underworld, I think, and his father brought him there in secret, I think, and he wants to see uh, what side of, of, of death is going to be revealed, because death in this myth has two, two sides to his face. One is beautiful, and the other is rotten away, and there's maggots, and there's a skeleton and the, fl the flesh rotting, and... The attendants of death, they look after one side one day and the next day they look after the other. And the myth goes that if you're born on the day when they're looking after the beautiful side of death, then you will have great fortune in life and you'll have a very lucky life. And it's the kind of people who everything goes right with if the Midas touch. But if you're looked after on the other day, or if you're there on the, where the other side of death is being looked after, then you'll be doomed to a life of ardour and misery. And these are the people we find who just have complete misfortune. So there's something we all kind of understand there in terms of luck and fortune, and it's the way circumstances sometimes just don't work for some people or they really work for others. And that's kind of captured in that myth, and maybe that's something here we can... We can map over onto this Bridget myth saying that she has two sides of her face and maybe if you want to look at that inspiration again the two sides of fire and fire has a beautiful side which is that it's it, it's warm it cooks our food it's it's that nourishing thing that is really that has made civilization that has made man what he is and that's Prometheus stealing God from the fire that's a reason why it's fire there fire is the thing that's transformed the human species so it has all those positive aspects, but then you've got the negative aspect of the fire, and that is the forest fires, the, the, the fact that it can burn you, the, the damage of, of fire. And again, you can map that with inspiration. You can see the when artists become maybe too consumed 
and they, when they're too close to the muses, it's, it's often a dangerous thing. So you get more inspiration when you're close to Bridget, but also you get Van Gogh chopping off his ear. So it's, it's, the fire has two sides. It has a beautiful side and an ugly side. So we might see that in the, in the fires of Bridget. I wonder what else we could talk about. There's the, the three things that were sacred above all to the Celts. The plough, the sun, and the hazel tree. We find the sun as a universal symbol of, again, like the like fire, it's got that universal warmth, that life-giving feature. So the sun is universally the one of the most Proclaim God again, Jesus' connection with the, the rising sun, um, the reborn sun of the 25th of December, when the mornings start to get longer and conquer the long night. So there's, you can see that sun, there's the Akhenaten, the religion in ancient Egypt, the first monotheistic religion, as far as we know. And he was the, the son of the sun god. And Again, we find that throughout mythology. There's the Jung talks about his visit to the Navajo on the west coast of the of the states, and how they believe that they were the sons of the sun, and if they didn't carry out their rituals, then the sun would never rise again, because they're at the edge of the world or at the west. So when it sets, they believe it won't rise again unless they do their myths. And so that's a universal kind of connection. We can understand why the sun would be so important. The plough for a uh, for any agricultural civilization, the plough is, is the symbol of that Promethean energy as well, so you can understand that. And the hazel tree is an interesting one to show in there. Um, the trees, obviously, trees have a connection with the, the Yggdrasil in the, in the Norse tradition, the, the, tree that, the tree of life that has connections going down into hell and up to heaven. Um, Nietzsche once said that any tree that would have shoots unto heaven must have roots unto hell and so trees have that kind of unifying symbolism of above and below and but the hazel is an interesting one though um, another thing that comes to mind is Yeats's poem uh, I went out to the hazel wood because a fire was in my head to cut and peel a hazel wand and hook a berry to a thread and when white moths were on the wing and moth like stars were flickering out I dropped the berry in a stream and hooked a little silver trout. And this is the story of wandering Angus, who will be the love god of, of, of the Gales. And you see in that connection the Yeats is tying it in there with the with something magic because in the second verse we see he takes that trout. When I had laid it on the floor I went to blow the fire of flame, but something rustled on the floor and someone called me by my name. It had become a glimmering girl with apple blossoms in her hair, who called me by my name and ran and faded through the brightening air. And so there's that connection, the, the hazel, the, the magical trout, he captures that, that witching hour of, of the early morning. So hazels, like willows, would have that connection with magic and with the, the druidic crafts. So that's interesting. And we see in the, the next part, she's talking about the the nine hazel trees that surround their well beneath the sea. So if you want to see us explore this in depth, me and Barry talk about this a lot in the, the Sam and the Knowledge episode, which I'll link here. Uh, but here we find the original mention of it. So you have the nine hazels and their blossoms would fall into the well. So the, there's again that connection of magic and their magical blossoms and it's the, the well beneath the sea, all very rich archetypal imagery. And these feed the salmons, and of course, this these salmons are the salmon of knowledge, um, as we see there, the ones that give their poets the inspiration. So again, yeah, that hazel, that hazel connection, that magical connection. We can see why the hazel would be so significant in connecting to that magical other world. So you've got the magical world, you've got the, the plow and the the agricultural, the I suppose what you'd call the quotidian, just the kind of the daily world. Uh, prosaic world and then the sun which is the, the unifying thing of all things um, over the earth and yeah we see her talking about the, the, the salmon so 
they would eat of that stream and the, or eat of that fountain of that of that well with the the hazel blossoms falling into it and then they'd head off along the streams and there were seven streams of wisdom that sprang from that well and turned back to it again and the people of many arts have all drank from that well so there's a variant of that myth that we see two versions of in the in the Finn McCool and the salmon knowledge so the salmon the salmon to get the, the wisdom but we also have the second story of Finn where he get splashed with the water from the well, so you get the two the two aspects of it here. So seven streams again, seven streams of wisdom. It's again a very archetypal kind of the, the seven. There's the seven days of the week, the seven sages of ancient Greece, the seven wonders of the world, the seven chakras. So the seven deadly sins. Uh, so you get this again this powerful archetypal connection, seven streams of wisdom. They're not just arbitrarily chosen numbers or numbers with a bit of a kick. Yeah, so that's the story of the coming of the two who did dawn into Ireland. It's, uh, for me, I love it. It's, it's like our version of Genesis. It's got all these, these rich archetypal streams in it. So I haven't exhausted them by any means there, but it's just a, an initial dipping into figuring out what was the origin? When did the gods come to Ireland? And I think it's a beautiful story. And if you liked it and you, you want to find out more, you can check out our videos. Um, Salmon and Knowledge, if you want to learn more about the, the wells. But for future episodes, hit the subscribe button. And yeah, thanks for watching.